I'm pastor of Cross Point in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and we welcome you to our worship time online today. Wherever you are watching or whatever time you're watching, we welcome you. I just want to share with you a wonderful opportunity that we have this coming Saturday, uh, May the 9th. Uh, we're going to have a food distribution at our location at 1414 Pennsylvania Avenue in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And there will be a lot more details coming out on that, so be watching Facebook uh, for details. And uh, we look forward to being able to bless uh, 100 families with boxes of food uh, on Saturday. So we uh, want you to be aware of that wonderful opportunity. Our scripture today is found in Psalm 95, verses 3 through 6. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we thank you and praise you for all that you have done. We we give you glory for who you are. We know that you are the maker and the creator of all things, and we give you praise. Lord, we are so thankful that we know that you are with us and you know our circumstances. And in this time of limited opportunity of being able to gather, we pray that every home, every living room, every family room, every office, every place where this uh, video is played that the Holy Spirit would be at work in the lives of people who participate in, in worship this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Wherever you are this morning, I want to encourage you to stand up and join in worship with us as our worship team leads us in a few selections. <laughs> falls he won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle What the 
enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the 
just a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. I can't control 
like for you to dream with me for a moment. Close your eyes and take in a deep breath. Can you smell the aroma of freshly baked bread? I'm sure that some of you have family members that have been baking during this COVID-19 virus and all the limitations. I remember hearing of stores that were out of flour and other ingredients that would be made for baking. Perhaps even if you're watching on Sunday morning, maybe your house is full of aromas of freshly baked items even as you're watching and worshiping this morning. I remember when I was a young man, first church that we were pastoring, a, a new husband, and uh, I was still uh, working on my bachelor's degree at uh, United Wesleyan College that was right here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I uh, was living, my wife and I were living in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, which is 78 miles away. And I would have to get up very early in the morning and prepare to drive to, to Allentown each day to make it for an 8 o'clock class. And uh, just about a half a block away from where we lived was Bella's Bakery, and Bella's was a German bakery, and I'd go out to get in the car early in the morning, and the just the, the aroma of freshly baked bread and donuts and cakes and all the things that they had there uh, were wafting in the air. But I don't blame Bella's for everything. Uh, we also had Wilbur Chocolate Factory, uh, not very far uh, away and uh, just a couple blocks from our house and and you could smell the chocolate mixing in with the aromas of those fresh fresh baked things and if you go the other direction about a block it was the oldest pretzel bakery in the United States Serge's uh, pretzel bakery was right there and so I mean you could gain weight just breathing in Lidditz in those days back in the in the mid 70s uh, I gained 40 pounds that year 
uh, but it wasn't all because of the air in Lydis. I married a farmer's daughter, and she was used to making things, or she had learned to cook by, by making things from scratch, and uh, she was used to making large portions, and I would, um, there would be some left over at the end of the meal, and she'd say, oh, that's just a little bit. You might as well finish that off until a year later, and I was 40 pounds heavier than I was when she married me, then she decided that wasn't such a good idea. But uh, just, just think of those aromas of, of the fresh baked bread. I'm going to talk to you today about the bread of life. And in the Bible, bread was used to represent the nourishment that we need in our bodies. The bread was the, the basic uh, ingredient. It wasn't talking about a whole feast, but that word bread just meant the, the basic uh, nutrients that we need to be able to live in the world. And Jesus said, we're continuing in our Jesus Is series. Matter of fact, we're concluding today with this sermon. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So just kind of keep that aroma in, in your mind, and I know the refrigerator isn't far from you if you're watching this from home. Just continue, just stay with me for a little while, and you'll be able to, to go and get some, some food to eat. But I want to give you the background setting of this story. Uh, this is in John chapter 6, and if you look at the Gospel of John, in John chapter 2, Jesus performed his very first miracle, and it was at the, the wedding in, in uh, Cana. And in John chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that he had turned into wine. They had run out of wine for this wedding celebration. And in those days, a, a wedding celebration was a week long. And they had run out of wine. And Jesus turn water into wine. And then in John chapter 3, uh, Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. And Nicodemus couldn't understand how he could be born again as an adult human being. And, and Jesus explained to him that he meant to be born again of the Spirit. And he used one of the Old Testament uh, stories uh, from uh, Israel's history to illustrate, and he said in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And, and, and you see how he's talking about the spiritual need uh, of the individual, that you must be born again, not physically, but spiritually. And then John chapter 4, Jesus is going through Samaria, and he comes to a well, and there is a woman there at the well, and he begins a conversation with her, and uh, she asks him a few questions, and, she, and he responds. And in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered this lady at the well, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, referring to the water in the well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He was not talking about a, a new kind or a different kind of physical water that would replace the water that this woman had come to the well to draw uh, for that day's activities and needs. But he was saying there's a spiritual water, a living water that I can give to you that you would never thirst again. And then in John chapter 5, uh, we see the healing of a man uh, at, at the pool of Bethesda. In John chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, it says, Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Here is a man who for decades had come to this pool, and, and he, he was not able to, to walk on his own. He needed help. He, he he uh, was handicapped and could not uh, walk on his own. And he came here for healing. And Jesus told him to get up, pick up your mat, and to go. Another miracle. 
And then we come to John chapter 6. And before we get to the passage that we're really looking at in our message this morning, we see the story of, jo of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Uh, and that was a, a figure that was just counting the men. That didn't include the women and children that, that were there. And they had come and they had listened all day to Jesus' teaching. And uh, as it came near the end of the day, the disciples wanted Jesus to encourage the people to leave because they, they didn't have access to, to enough food to feed this large of a crowd. And uh, Jesus told them to find what was, food was available. And in John chapter 6, verse 9, they came back to Jesus and he said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, Okay, just have all these people sit in groups of 50 and bring me this small lunch that you have found. And Jesus took that bread and, and those fish and they distributed them. And in John chapter 6, verses 12 to 13, it says, And when they had had enough to eat, that whole crowd of people, maybe 15,000 if you include the women and children, uh, when, when they had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And then in John chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, after that long day of teaching, and after uh, feeding the 5,000, Jesus went off into a solitary place into the mountains, and the disciples were heading over to the other side of the lake, to Capernaum. And in John 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, And when they had rowed, about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approach the boat, walking on water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. A storm had come up, and, and uh, the, the, the winds were blowing, and the, the waves were rough, and the, and the disciples were, were fearful, and Jesus came walking on the water to them. And then we come to these verses that we want to look at today from John chapter 6, the crowd finds Jesus then. After, after they had gotten to the other side, to Capernaum, the, the crowd, or many of them, went around the lake and they found him in Capernaum. Uh, and, but Jesus knew that they were looking for him only because of the miracle with the bread. They wanted him to feed him. And, and Jesus said, don't work for bread that spoils. Work for the good food that endures to eternal life. The Son of Man will give it to you. And so here we, we see again that Jesus is not talking about physical bread. As good as that is and how necessary it is in this life. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, He's talking about the bread of eternal life. He's, he's giving us the spiritual food. And when he, Jesus said that, the, the, the crowd said, well, what are the works that we must do to receive this? They, they were used to, to a works-based religion, and so they thought, well, we're going to have to do something to earn this. And Jesus said, there's only one work, to believe in the one that he has sent me. Jesus answered in verse uh, 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. It was not works that they must do to earn the bread, but it was the work of God to provide the faith that they would believe in the one that He has sent. Instead of trying to earn the bread or to earn the blessing, uh, they were simply to believe that Jesus truly was the Son of God and truly is the Son of God. And then they said, and what miraculous sign will you give us? Are you kidding me? I mean, they may not have been everywhere where Jesus had been, but he turned water into wine. He healed a man. Uh, he, he talked about the spiritual uh, need of being born again, the spiritual need of, of uh, living water. Uh, he had fed them, the, this crowd, he had fed them uh, the... Uh, 
loaves and, and uh, the fish to a crowd of thousands of people from just a, one small lunch. And they're saying, well, what sign are you going to give us that, that you are who you say you are? And all that Jesus had done to this point was to perform mirac miraculous signs and point people to salvation through Him. And, and I think that as we look at this part of the New Testament, we, we can realize that there are some people whose hearts are set against God and against His work, and no matter what happens, they will not turn to Him. And it's their choice. It's their heart. But there are those people who find that. I mean, they were blinded. They, they had eaten the bread and the fish that Jesus had multiplied. And they come to Him and say, well, what sign are you going to give to us so that we can believe in you? Their forefathers had had manna, Jesus told them, but they died. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And if you come to Me, you will never go hungry. You will never thirst again. And you will eat and not die. In John 6.36, it says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to Me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in Me will never be thirsty. And then in verses 48-50, to 50, there in John 6, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Again, he is using the physical to demonstrate the spiritual. He wasn't talking about a loaf of freshly baked bread. He was talking about that he was the spiritual nourishment that they did, that they needed. That, not that they would never physically die, but that they would be able to live eternally with him. Jesus tells them that they must eat His flesh and drink His blood. And He said this in the synagogue of Capernaum. There were many Jewish leaders there and rabbis that would have been there. And they all began to argue among themselves. They couldn't deny His miracles, but they couldn't imagine what He was saying when He said that they were going to have to eat His flesh and drink His blood. And they thought that he was talking about physical flesh and blood. And this was abhorrent to the Jews. They, they were thinking of cannibalism. And they were thinking of, of drinking human blood. And they were not even allowed to drink the blood of animals. And this was totally abhorrent, uh, abhorrent to them. And, and Jesus later explained to a group of disciples or those who were following him that it is spiritual flesh and blood. In John 6:63, 6, he says, "The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life." So when he's saying, "I am the bread, and you will eat my flesh and drink my blood," he's not talking about physical bread. He's not talking about uh, physical uh, flesh and physical blood, but he's talking about the spiritual nourishment that they need that they could come to Him and partake and, and that they would uh, be able to have eternal life. And this spiritual relationship with Jesus is the dividing point between those who truly believe and those who are insincere. And if you read the, the latter part of this chapter, chapter 6, you will find that there was a large group of people that Jesus is referring to and that John's referring to in writing this, as disciples. They were followers. They were a large group. The people that had been there for the teaching and feeding of the 5,000, that was a large gathering. And they followed him around to Capernaum, not even knowing where he would be, but they were trying to find him. And then there was the 12. And, and you'll, you'll see where Jesus talks to the 12 and talks about uh, him choosing them and, and whether they were going to leave him also. But out of this large mass of people, it says that many of those disciples, many of those followers, many of those people that were in the crowd left Jesus and, and went away. In John chapter 6, verse 66, it says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. 
Now there, he's not talking about the 12 disciples here. He's talking about the large gathering. And you know, there's, there's a lot of people today that are willing to acknowledge God and maybe even go to church and participate in religious activities, but their heart is not turned toward God. Their heart is not given over to Jesus. Their, their focus is on the physical. The, their focus is on the, their own material uh, needs and desires and goals rather than on Jesus Himself. And Jesus later then took physical bread and gave it to them to eat as a reminder of His broken body for them. He was talking about spiritual bread, but He gave them physical bread to remember. I don't know about you, but as human beings, we have a tendency to forget. Uh, we, can, we can have all kinds of blessings, but in the midst of our blessings, we can be looking at the little bit that we want that we don't have and be focusing on what we don't have while we're ignoring all the blessings. And, and we can forget uh, who gives us those blessings. And so Jesus, before He was crucified, gave the disciples a physical uh, remembrance so that they would not forget what He done for them. And in Luke 22, verse 19, we see in Scripture, and He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, it, it's for us to remember what Jesus has done. He's our spiritual bread, but we use physical bread to remember what He has done for us. It's possible to eat the bread of Holy Communion without the spiritual bread of relationship with Jesus Christ. Think of that original Last Supper that Jesus had with His disciples. Judas was there. Jesus washed Judas's feet. Jesus gave Judas the bread and said, Take, eat. and Remember my body which is broken for you. He, he, Judas was able to join in the cup that was shared. This is my blood that is shed for you. But there was not any real spiritual connection. Judas had already arranged with the, the Jewish leaders and the Romans that he was going to betray Jesus. And so eating the physical bread of Holy Communion is to reflect the spiritual bread that is already in our lives. Jesus is the bread of life. And, and so that comes forth comes first. The spiritual bread, believe that Jesus is the bread of life sent from the Father, comes before the physical bread. Take, eat. Okay? And so, taking communion does not save you. It does not change you. It is just physical food. It is a reminder, however, of what has already happened happened in your life. Jesus already died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again. His blood was shed on the cross for your sins. And as He instructed, we take the bread to remember the spiritual bread, to remember the body of Christ that was broken. We take the cup to remember the blood that was shed on Calvary. Communion does save you. The sacraments do not save you. It is through the sacraments that we remind ourselves of the salvation that Jesus has brought. It is the outward sign of what Jesus has been inside of us. Because if we didn't pause from time to time and partake of communion, as human beings, we would have a tendency to be so wrapped up in our lives, in the material world, in the things that we are, are working in and living in and, and our own families and our own homes and our own businesses and our own jobs and, and all the things that we do, if we didn't pause to remember, we would forget. And so Jesus tells us to remember. Before we partake of communion this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity. If anyone is watching 
this service this morning and you have never received Jesus as your Savior, as we partake of communion this morning, this is the perfect time to open and confess your sins and ask Jesus to forgive your sin and, and repent and turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus so that He can put you in right relationship with God the Father and that you will follow Jesus the remainder of your life. This is a great moment to make that decision if you have not done that yet. If you have asked Jesus to be your Savior and you're living for Him, this is a great time of reflection and remembrance. We, our, our news media and our thinking has been dominated by COVID-19 and all the problems and all the limitations and, and all the things that have happened. And in this quiet moment, in the midst of all of that, to be able to sit with a piece of bread and a cup and remember what Jesus has done. Now, we're not gathered this morning, and we're not going to be able to serve the communion. If you haven't already made preparations, if you can just find a piece of bread or a cracker or a cookie or something that you have right there in your home, get that for you and your family. Break it up. If you have a cookie, just break it up and give it to the members of your family. Get some juice out of the refrigerator and pour it into cups for everybody to have a sip. And we're going to partake of Holy Communion. But before you do that, if you don't know Jesus, ask Jesus to forgive your sin. Turn away from your sin and turn to Him and have your relationship with God the Father renewed. Let's bow our heads for prayer this morning. Lord, right now, all across the Lehigh Valley, all across the United States and even parts of the world, there are people who are watching this service. I pray first of all for any who do not know Jesus as Savior, that they would confess their sin, repent and turn from their sin, Turn to Jesus and ask Him to forgive their sin and restore a right relationship with God the Father. And that right now in this moment that they would dedicate themselves to following Jesus. And for all who already know you, whatever they have prepared in front of them, a piece of bread, a cracker, broken cookie, whatever it may be, I pray that you would sanctify it that you would bless it and consecrate it to yourself, that it would be the memory of the broken body of Christ to us. And take that little bit of juice, whatever it may be. And Lord, I pray that you would consecrate it and that we would be reminded of the blood that shed on Calvary for our sins. May you be glorified in our remembrance this morning. Amen. If you would take whatever you have representing the body of Christ, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body that was broken for you you may partake of the body of Christ. And then he took a cup and he gave it to them. He said, drink the blood of the new covenant, the blood that I have shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Partake of the blood of Christ. Thank you for joining with us in this time of worship. And I pray that as you have partaken of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, would be reminded anew and afresh what Jesus has done for you. 
And if today you ask Jesus to be your Savior, you prayed, confessing your sin, repenting and turning away from your sin and turning to Jesus to restore a right relationship with God the Father, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, please let us know in the comments section of this video, wherever you're watching, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or on our um, website, I pray that you would let us know so that we can join in prayer with you and for you and celebrate what Jesus has done in your life today. I pray. Lord, we thank you today for your presence. And I pray again that every place where this video is shown, that it becomes a sanctuary, that it has been a sanctuary in the places where people are watching this. And as you partaken of the sacrament of communion, that they would sense the presence of God as real and as true as they would if they were sitting in a seat in the church. Send us forth into this broken world to be your servants. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.